What's up? I'm Vin, and today we're going through the 2003 BC Calc Multiple Choice Part A. And question one, we're starting off with chain rule. The derivative of the outside is cosine. We keep the inside as 3x, and then we multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is 3. So now we just match this. This is going to be choice E. For the next question here, this looks like a L'Hopital question, but we just have to be careful. I would always try to plug in first, and if you plug in 0, you're going to get 1 minus cosine of 0 is 1 minus 2 times 0 is 0 over, and if you plug in 0, you get 0 minus 0. So in the free response, don't ever write this, but in the multiple choice, your notation could be off, and it's not going to matter because just your correct answer matters. So here we're going to use L'Hopital, and we're going to do the derivative of the top and the bottom. Remember, doing L'Hopital is like doing the quotient rule the wrong way. So the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Derivative of minus cosine is going to go to plus sine. And the derivative of minus 2x is minus 2. On bottom, we have 2x minus 2. So now we plug in 0. And we have e to the 0 is 1. Plus sine of 0 is 0. Minus 2 over 0 minus 2. So this is going to make negative 1 over negative 2, which makes positive 1 half. So this is going to be choice C. Now we're moving on here to the next question. And this is going to be a u sub. It helps if you could do u sub really quickly. So anytime your u term is linear, something like 3x plus 1, that means we could skip the whole u sub process. But let's pretend we don't know the u sub process. So what we did was we define u, calculate du. The derivative of 3x plus 1 is 3, and then we tack on dx. And what we're going to solve for here is the dx term. So that's going to be 1 third du. That's going to be dx here. And now we just go ahead and make the substitution. So instead of 3x plus 1 to the fifth, that's going to be u to the fifth. And instead of dx, dx is equal to 1 third du. And I like to write the constants on the outside if they're attached by multiplication or division. So now here, just do the antiderivative. You got 1 third, and you got u to the 6 over 6 plus c. And then 3 times 6 is 18. So we have 1 over 18, u to the 6 power plus c. But instead of u, u is equal to 3x plus 1. So now we just have to match that. And that looks like choice A. All right, this is a very wordy word problem, but we have an object traveling on an elliptical path, and we have these parametric equations. We're at t equals 13, and when the object leaves the ellipse, so just imagine there's like an object spinning around this, it just gets launched. And we want to know what's the line tangent. So we're looking for, I'm sorry, the slope of the line tangent at which the object leaves. So like hypothetically, if the particle were spinning around like this and it just gets launched, you want to know, like, what's the slope of that tangent line? So the slope of a tangent line to a parametric curve is equal to dy dt over dx dt. So all we have to do for this question here is just take the derivative of the y equation. And the derivative of 4 sine t with respect to t is going to be 4 cosine t. And on bottom, dx dt, we take the derivative of this. The derivative of 3 cosine is negative 3 sine. So now all you have to do is just plug in 13. But what we could do first, notice how the answer choices have a tangent in them that something like this, cosine over sine, we could call cotangent. We're going to use a trig identity. So 4 over negative 3, we could just call negative 4 thirds. And then we have cotangent of t. So when we plug in 13, this is going to give us negative 4 thirds cotangent of 13. However, notice that's not an answer choice. So the reciprocal of cotangent is tangent. And that's where we're getting this negative 4 over 3 tangent 13 from. So this is like a little bit of weird algebra you have to do at the end. But now we match it, and this is going to match up with choice D. And be mindful, the negative could go in the numerator, denominator, or all the way in front. So choice D is definitely it. So next up, we have Euler's method. And for these questions, you just have to be very organized. So make a chart, and you got x, y, and y prime, also known as dy dx. So we start with the point 1, 2. And we're trying to approximate f of 2. So that goes at the end of your chart. And we're taking a step size of 0 0.5. So if I do 1 plus 0 0.5, that's the next number, 1.5. And then if I do another plus 0 0.5, that brings me to the end. So we're doing two steps here. And the key to these questions is you have to find x, y, and the slope, and then write the equation of a line. So to find the slope, I have y prime at the point 1, 2. And remember, for multiple choice, your notation could be really bad. But I'm just showing this so we know what we're plugging into. So we're going to plug 1, 2 into the derivative. And that's going to tell us the slope. So we have 1 plus 2 
is equal to 3, so that's our slope. And then what we need to know for this, we have to know the equation of a tangent line. So we have y equals m times x minus x1 plus y1. We could write it as y minus y1, but I like to already have it solved. So now I just plug in. Our slope is equal to 3. We have x minus x1 and then plus the y coordinate 2. So now we're going to approximate the y value at x equals 1.5. So we do that by just plugging in. So we have y of 1.5 equals, and if we plug in 1.5 to our line here, we have 1.5 minus 1 is 0.5, and then plus 2. So that's going to equal 1.5 plus 2, which is 3.5. So that's our next y value. But then what we do is we plug this x and y into our derivative to get our new slope. So we'll go ahead and do that now. So now we have y prime at 1.5, and let's make that neat, comma, 3.5. And that equals, if you plug in 1.5 plus 3.5 is equal to 5. So that's our new slope. And then we use that new slope to write another equation of a tangent line. Or technically, this one's not going to be tangent because it's not going to be exactly on the curve. So this is going to be y equals, and our new slope is 5. We have x minus the x coordinate is 1.5 plus the y coordinate is 3.5. So then to approximate f of 2, that's the last step. So we could just write it here. f of 2 is approximately equal to 5 times 2 minus 1 and a half is a half, and then plus 3.5. So this is going to give us 2.5 plus 3.5, and that's going to work out to 6. So our approximation here is going to be choice C. Now question 6 is a really good question. This one, you have to know all your convergence tests for series. So if we look at this one here, this reminds me of the integral test. So the integral test, if you could show that the improper integral converges, then the corresponding series is going to converge as well. So I'm just going to analyze this series, 1 over n to the 2p. And notice this looks like a p-series. The only trap here, though, is that it's not 1 over n to the p. It's 1 over n to the 2p. But the way the p-series test works is that your exponent of your p-series, in this case, the entire exponent is 2 times p, has to be bigger than 1. So in this case, p has to be bigger than a half. Just note, though, this is not the definition or the theorem for p-series. In this specific case, once again, the coefficient of p is 2. So this is kind of like put an asterisk next to it. This is not the true definition or theorem for p-series, but... In this one, we just set the exponent to be bigger than 1 and solve, and p has to be greater than a half. For question 7, we just have to know our motion problems here, and we have a particle moving in the xy direction. We have parametric equations, and we want to know for what values of t is the particle at rest. So for particle questions like this, you need the x and y velocity to equal 0. This is the main idea of this question. So the x velocity we would find by finding dx dt or we could call it x prime. And that's going to be 3t squared minus 6t when we do the power rule. And then next, we could find the y velocity, which is going to be 6t squared minus 6t minus 12. So now you have to find out when are they both equal to 0. So if you set the first equation in purple equal to 0, we have 3t times t minus 2 equals 0. This will give you t equals 0 and t equals 2. But when you set the second equation equal to 0, I'm going to preemptively factor out a 6. Left t squared left minus t minus 2 equals 0. And this is going to give us 6 times t minus 2 times t plus 1 after we factor. And this is going to give us two roots. We'll have t equals 2, t equals negative 1. But notice which one do they have in common. t equals 2 is what they both have in common. And remember, we have to show when the x and y velocity is equal to 0. So t equals 2 only. Notice anything with a negative 1 or a 0 is a very dangerous trap. But anytime just your x velocity is 0, so if only x velocity was 0, that means your particle could still move up and down. And if your y velocity is 0 and your x isn't, that means your particle is just moving left and right. For this next question here, I know we have to use u sub. And the mental check that I go through here is if the inside term of my function, if I take the derivative of the inside term, Notice I get 3x squared, and I have an x squared here, and I have an x squared in front of my cosine function. So that gives it away that we're going to do u sub. So I let u equal x to the third, and then du is going to equal 3x squared dx. 
Now, there's two ways you could go through with this. You could solve for dx, or you could solve for the leftovers. And what I like to do, I like to solve for the leftovers. Notice there's an x squared and a dx left. So I'm going to get x squared dx alone by moving the 3 to the other side. And we'll have 1 third du equals x squared dx. So now we could go ahead and make the substitution here. So we have the integral of cosine of u. And notice everything that's left, x squared dx, is equal to 1 third du. And we take the antiderivative. We're going to have 1 third sine u plus c. And this is going to be 1 third, make that a little darker, sine of u is x to the third, and then plus c. So this is going to match up with choice b here. Just know if you ever get stuck for questions like this, you could just take the derivative of everything. But by the time you get to these answer choices, you'd have to do product rule, and that could be pretty painful. So just being able to do u sub will save you a little bit of time here. Question nine, chain rule again. Just know the chain rule is very likely to show up at least five times on the AP test. So be awesome at the chain rule. Now, the chain rule for natural log is when you have natural log of a function and you're taking the derivative, you do one over the inside and then the derivative of the inside goes on top. So it helps to know these little shortcuts, like to go, be able to go through them quickly. So we have one over the inside and then the derivative of the inside, we have one plus the derivative of 4, 0, and then, oh, be careful. To take the derivative of e to the minus 3x, we have to do the chain rule again. So notice, anytime you take a derivative of e to a number times x, it's the number times e to the kx like this. So that means the derivative of e to the minus 3x is going to be minus 3 e to the minus 3x. And lucky for us, we get to plug in 0. So we're going to have 1 minus 3e to the 0 over 0 plus 4. And then we're going to have plus 1 when we plug in 0 here. So this gives us 1 minus 3, because e to the 0, again, is equal to 1. So we have negative 2 over 5, and it's going to work out to choice A. So this is a nice geometric series question. The way I evaluate geometric series is I do the first term, the first thing, over 1 minus r. So for something like this, though, identifying r could be tricky when it's written like this. So what I like to do for, uh, for questions like this is I like to get the exponents to match. So notice 2 to the n plus 1 has a power 1 higher than the denominator power. So what we could do is we could rewrite the top as 2 times 2 to the n. Because technically 2 to the first times 2 to the n is equal to 2 to the n plus 1. And then it's over 3 to the n. And now these two could be grouped together. We're going to use this rule of algebra. When you have a to the c over b to the c, that's the same thing as a over b to the c power. So your algebra has to be really strong. Just know AP Calc is like 80% algebra. So just be really good at the algebra. So we have 2 times 2 thirds to the n power. So now the first term starts, so we're starting at n equals 1. So the first term is going to be 2 times 2 thirds to the first over, and now in this shape it's recognizable that r is equal to 2 thirds. So we have 1 minus 2 thirds. Just notice a geometric series is geometric because, well, what makes it geometric is the r value. That's the thing you multiply by each time to get to the next term. So when it's in this shape, it's easy to identify r. And now we've got 2 times 2 thirds. And 1 minus 2 thirds on bottom is 1 third. And this is going to make 2 times 2 thirds times 3 when we do uh, keep change flip or multiply top and bottom by the reciprocal. And then 3 over 3 cancels. This is going to work out to 4. So this is going to be choice C. So next up here, we have a Maclaurin series for 1 over 1 minus x. And we want to know the power series expansion for this. So the key is, for questions like this, you have to think about what changes are being made to build up this series. So this is the one we're trying to build. And we're starting with this. So the first thing that we could do is we could replace the x on the inside here with x squared. So that's the first adjustment we're going to make. So we have x squared like this. So instead of x to the n, we're going to have x squared to the n power. But then notice the numerator is being multiplied by x to the second. So we'll do this in a different color. The numerator is being multiplied by x to the second. So if we multiply this by x squared, we're going to have to put an x squared in front like this. So now when we simplify that series a bit, this is going to be the series from n equals 0 to infinity of. And this works out, once again, algebra is really important. a to the b to the c is a to the bc. So we would have x to the 2n, and if we do x to the 2n times x squared, then it's this rule of algebra. We add the exponents together. So we have x to the 2n plus 2 
like this. And now I'll just expand the first few terms. If you plug in 0 to start, you're going to have x to the 2 times 0 plus 2 plus x to the, if you plug in 1, you have 2 plus 2 is 4 plus plug in 2, you have x to the 4 plus 2 is 6, then x to the 8, and so on. And notice this works out to just x to the second. So we could just say this is x to the second. And now I just look to the answer key. This is going to match up with choice D. Now question 12 might be a little bit outdated, but this language, direct proportion, is when we have y equals k times x. So we would say y is directly proportional to x. This is direct. And then inverse proportion is when we have y equals k over x, or x times y equals k. So notice here we're saying directly proportional. So now we just kind of have to fill in the blanks. The rate of change of the volume V. So that stuff in blue is dV over dt. And then we're saying here is directly proportional. So is directly proportional means we're using k here. And it's directly proportional to the square root of the volume. And the square root of the volume would be square root V. So notice we're just using this definition here for direct proportion. And this is going to match up with choice E. So question 13, we're looking for where F is continuous, but not differentiable. So for something like this, A jumps out at me right away because of the sharp turn. So because we have a sharp turn, that means that F is not differentiable at x equals A. But notice it's connected here, so it is continuous. So this is going to be the answer right away. The reason why it's not B is because we're not continuous there. And if we're not continuous, we're automatically not differentiable. So it would be neither. Here at point C, we're both continuous and differentiable. So it's not this one. At point D, we're not continuous because of the jump. And if we're not continuous, we're not differentiable. And then at E, we're both continuous and differentiable. So definitely A. Now for these slow field questions, the key is to look for a pattern and see if you could rule it out or narrow it down to just one answer choice. So for something like this, what I notice is that anytime x is positive, the slope is positive. And anytime x is negative, so we're like when we're in quadrants two and three here, the slopes are negative. So what that means is that the slope really depends on x being positive or negative, which means that x is very likely to have an odd power. So what I'm imagining is x to an odd power. But notice, the fact that y, when we plug in a negative uh, y value here, that it doesn't change the slope from positive to negative makes me think y is going to have an even power attached. So notice once again in quadrant 2 we have a bunch of negative slopes, but in quadrant 3 changing the sign of y doesn't make the slopes go from negative to positive. So changing the sign of y has no effect on changing the sign of the slope, which makes me think y to an even power. And if we look, that's going to match up with choice E. But what you could do to rule out the other answer choices, let's say you're not confident with this method, is you could plug in test points. You could plug in something like the point 1, 1. You can plug in something like negative 1, positive 1. You could plug in negative 1, negative 1. And you could plug in something like 1, negative 1. And that'll help you eliminate all the other answer choices. But once again, uh, this idea is really helpful if you want to just get right to the answer. So question 15 is really nice because it starts from the end and we have to work backwards. So we have to know the formula for arc length, which is the integral from a to b of 1 plus f prime of x squared dx. So if we look at this, they already gave us the length of the curve in an integral. So we just have to match things up here. So this tells us that f prime of x squared is going to be equal to 9x to the fourth. So it's as if they already took the derivative and plugged in for us. But now if we want to get the derivative, we're not going to say equals here. We'll say this tells us that f prime of x, if we take the square root of both sides, is going to be equal to 3x squared. So if we want to find f of x, all we're going to do here is just take the integral of 3x squared dx. So we take the integral of f prime, and that's going to give us x to the third plus c. But now we have to solve for the constant, and they told us the point 1, 6 is on our curve. So if we plug in... Uh, x equals 1 here, we're going to get 1 to the third plus c is equal to 6, which is going to tell us c is equal to 5, so our exact function is going to be x to the third plus 5. All right, and we look here, that's going to match up with choice b. Now, for the next question here, this one, sometimes the challenge is just understanding what's even going on in the question. But they told us the line tangent to the graph of f at the point 1, 7. So just pretend we're all the way up here. At this point 1, 7 passes through the point negative 2, negative 2. So let's say this tangent line to the curve goes all the way down like this. All right, now this is not drawn to scale, but once again, the idea is that whatever our curve looks like, this curve could look like a whole, you know, a bunch of things here. 
that the tangent line to the curve at the point 1, 7 hits the point negative 2, negative 2. So then what that tells us is that the slope, we could use the old school slope equation, that the slope between the point 1, 7 and negative 2, negative 2, we would have 7 minus negative 2 over 1 minus negative 2. So we're just doing y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And that's going to give us 9 over 3, which tells us the slope of our tangent line is equal to 3. So if we want to find out what is the slope of the function at x equals 1, well, it's going to match the slope of the tangent line. So f prime of 1 is equal to 3, and this is going to go with choice C. So now next up here, we have a curve C defined by these parametric equations. And we want to know the line tangent to the graph of C at this point. So now I personally forget the formula for the slope of a tangent line to a parametric curve. But the idea is that it's dy dt over dx dt. And I understand why this formula works, because the algebra would check out dt over dt would cancel, giving you dy dx. So then the next stage here is to just find dy dt is 3t squared over, and then you'd have 2t minus 4. Now, most people, when they go through a question like this, will start it like this. But then this is our first dilemma. We say, oh, no, what do we plug in for t? So for questions like this, the challenge is knowing that you have to go on a side quest and you have to solve for the value of t. So let's say I plug in, I have y equals t to the third, and my y value here is 8. So if I let y equals 8 and I set that equal to t to the third, that tells me t is equal to 2. Or what I could do is I could set x equal to negative 3. And if I set x equal to negative 3, we have t squared minus 4t plus 1. Add 3 to both sides, you have 0 equals t squared minus 4t plus 4. And now if we factor this, we get t minus 2 squared, also giving us a value of t equal to 2. So now from here, what we're going to do is we're going to plug t equals 2 into our derivative. So I'm just going to say y prime just to speed things up. So our derivative at t equals 2 is going to give us 3 times 2 squared. And notice when we plug in 2 on bottom, we're going to get 0. And this slope is undefined. And any time you have an undefined slope like this, where you have a number on top and a zero on bottom, like a non-zero on top, zero on bottom, you know your line is going to be vertical. So that means we have a vertical tangent. And if we have to pass through the point negative 3, 8. So our point negative 3, 8, let's say we're like, I don't know, way over here. So negative 3, 8 not drawn to scale. That tells us the equation of our line is just going to be x equals negative 3. So we're going with choice A. All right, this question here we are looking at, we have g of x is the integral from 0 to 2x of f of t dt. And we want to find g prime of 3. So g prime of x, we're going to do the derivative here using ftc part 2. So what we do is when we take the derivative of this integral, the 2x is going to replace the t. But then we have to remember to multiply by the derivative of 2x, which is 2. Now, technically, I could say minus f of 0 times the derivative of the lower limit is 0, but that's not going to add anything to our derivative, so we'll just leave that part out. So now what we want to find is what is g prime of 3? So we just, we're just going to plug in here. 2 times 3 is 6, and then we're multiplying by 2. So now we have to find f of 6, and that's going to be over here. Now, this is not the best graph in the world, but we have to go with what's closest. So here, f of 6, we're going to say is equal to negative 1. So we have negative 1 times 2 is negative 2, and we're going with choice C. For this question here, it's phrased a little bit awkwardly, but we're told that a curve has a slope at each point x, y on the curve. That's a fancy way of saying derivative. So we could say dy dx is equal to 2x plus 3. And the next thing that we know here, that this curve passes through the point 1, 2. So this is kind of like our initial condition. We could say that y of 1 is equal to 2. So if we separate variables or we just solve for y here, we could just take the integral of both sides, and the antiderivative of 2x is going to be x squared. And the antiderivative of 3 is 3x, and we just tack on plus c. So now we use that initial condition, y of 1. That's going to give us 1 plus 3 plus c. And we know that's equal to 2, which tells us that c is going to be equal to negative 2. So our full equation, y, is going to be x squared plus 3x minus 2. And we're going with choice d. So next up here, we have a Maclaurin series for f given here. We want to know which of the following could be an expression for f of x. So this question here is a little bit tricky, but it was a fun question. So let's say I start with this. And one thing that was bothering me that x to the fourth is off from matching that factorial by 2. So my first instinct was to factor out a 2. And then we get x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the third over 3 factorial. And then once we go through with this, everything matches. So now we would have x to the m plus 1 
over M plus one factorial. And one piece of advice for the AP test, you have to show up knowing the McLaurin series for e to the x, sine x, and cosine x. You have to be able to just recite these cold. And you should recognize this as almost the McLaurin series for e to the x. So just know e to the x would start at one, and then we'd have plus x, plus x squared over two factorial, and then it would go on and on. But notice here, this one starts at the third term. It's missing the one plus x. So the idea is that we have to do a little bit of algebra here. So what we have is we have x squared, and I'm going to write the rest of this. We have x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the third over 3 factorial, and we're just going to assume this pattern forever. But now I'm going to introduce, I want to introduce those first two terms that are missing, the 1 plus x. But remember, you can't just in math introduce something and pretend like that no one will see it and just hope for the best. So what we have to do, if I introduce 1 plus x, we have to imagine that if I were to distribute x squared, that would give me a plus x squared and a plus x to the third. So after this, I'm going to subtract x squared and I'm going to subtract x to the third so that it would cancel out the terms that I introduced. All right, it's kind of like the idea is that if I had the equation 5 equals 5, I could add 7 to the right side as long as I say minus 7 right after it. So if I introduce it here, I have to subtract it right after. So now we're just going to uh, we're going to continue with this and close this out. So we could simplify. This is going to be x squared. This is the McLaurin series right here. That's the McLaurin series for e to the x. So we could say x squared times e to the x, and then we have minus x squared minus x to the third. And this is going to match up with choice D. These terms are just flipped here, but it's going to be the same thing. So question 21, we have a logistic differential equation. And we're given the equation here. Now, for these questions, the formulas could be a little bit tricky to remember. But the best advice I could give for these questions is know how to draw this. And also know the idea that as the curve goes towards infinity, so in this case, we'll say as t goes to infinity, it's important to note that the slope goes to zero. All right, so as t goes to infinity, dm dt goes to zero. So how does this help us? Well, if we set dm over dt equal to zero, so we set 0.6m times 1 minus m over 200. If we set this equal to zero, this one gives you m equals zero. But if you set that factor equal to zero, that's going to give you m equals 200. So this nice little trick tells you the value of that upper horizontal asymptote, the carrying capacity. In a lot of formulas, they call that capital L, the carrying capacity of the logistic curve. And what that tells us, what is the limit as t goes to infinity of m of t? Well, as we head all the way to the right, our cutoff height is 200. So this is going to be choice B. Now, for question 22, there's a nice little shortcut for this. What I like to imagine for these questions is I just focus on the leading terms. And I think about what would be the series if I just had n to the first over n to the p. And this would go to 1 over n to the p minus 1. Just know this rule in algebra, a to the b over a to the c is equal to a to the b minus c. However, you could also say a to the b over a to the c is equal to 1 over a to the c minus b. This version of the formula is very helpful for dealing with p series. So now what we have here, this series is only going to converge provided that the exponent p minus 1 is bigger than 1, which means that p has to be greater than 2. So we're going to go with choice E here. Question 23, we have to use integration by parts. The reason why I know we're using integration by parts and not U substitution is that if I let U equal 6X, DU is equal to 6DX, but notice there's an X in front. So I need to have an X in my derivative if I'm doing U sub. So instead, we're going to be using integration by parts. And we have to know the formula. We have U dV is equal to, or the integral of U dV is equal to UV minus the integral of v du. So first we're going to define our u term. And this mnemonic is helpful, liate. So if we look, just making sure I'm spelling it right. In this case here, our u term is going to be x because that's algebraic. The next one in order would be trig and then exponential. First is log and then it's inverse trig is second. So notice the algebra function outweighs the trig function. It shows up before in this mnemonic. So u is, e is going to equal x, and then dv is going to equal sine of 6x dx. So now we find du. du is just equal to dx, or 1 times dx. And the antiderivative of sine 6x, it's really helpful to know these formulas. 
the integral of sine of a number times x dx is equal to negative 1 over k cosine kx plus c. So if you don't know that, you have to go on a side quest and do a u sub here. So it really helps to know those quick formulas for the AP test. So we have negative 1 over 6 cosine of 6x and then we have plus c. So now we're just going to apply the formula. This is going to be equal to u times v. So we have negative 1 over 6 and we'll just write the x first. So negative 1 over 6 times x times cosine of 6x. Now technically that plus c we don't have to write until the very very end. So I'll just go ahead and get rid of this now. So you could write it there but once again you save it for the very very end. You don't have to keep writing plus c a million times. And now here what we have is minus and I have minus negative 1 over 6 which could change this to a plus 1 over 6 integral cosine of 6x dx. So now the same way we have a shortcut for sine kx we need a shortcut for cosine 6x in our integral. So this is going to be minus 1 over 6x cosine 6x and then the antiderivative we have plus 1 over 6 times the antiderivative of cosine 6x is going to be sine 6x over 6 and then we tack on our plus c. So notice we're starting off with negative x over 6 and we have cosine 6x which narrows it down to choices b and c and then after this we have plus 1 over 36 this will combine to so 6 times 6 will make 36 so we have plus 1 over 36 sine 6x. The person who got choice c very sad but they forgot to do that uh, u sub shortcut one more time in their integral but we should be getting choice b here. Question 24 is nice because you have to know all your convergence tests here. So this, if we look at this, this is a geometric series. So the main question here is the absolute value of sine 2 over pi, is that less than 1? This is what we need to answer. Well, just know sine of 2 or sine of anything, sine of x is less than or equal to 1. So at most, we don't have a calculator here. We could take this to be the maximum. Sine of 2 over pi is less than or equal to 1 over pi, and is that something that if we throw in the absolute value here, is this less than 1? And that's definitely true, because pi, I could do a bad approximation, is roughly 3.14. So this checks out as a convergent geometric series. So which of the following series will diverge? Not this one. This one is going to converge. Okay, so this is a convergent geometric series. This one will diverge, because if we rewrite it, it's 1 over n to the 1 over 3. And this is a p-series, and we'll make that neater. So n uh, to the 1 over 3 on bottom. p is equal to a third, and because our power here is less than or equal to 1, that tells us that our p-series is going to diverge. So definitely this. And then 3, we're going to do the nth term test for divergence. The limit as n goes to infinity of the general term of our series here is equal to 1. And remember, the nth term test for divergence is that if you get something other than zero when you take the limit as n goes to infinity of the general term of your series, it automatically is going to be a divergent series. So here we're going with two and three only. So this one here, we're going to use the three subintervals to approximate the definite integral from two to 14 of f of x, and we're using a right Riemann sum. So if we're using three subintervals, first we have to identify what are the delta x's. So from two to five, we're jumping by three, and then we pick the value on the right, which is 28. And then the next interval to look at would be from 5 to 10, and that's a jump of 5. And we use the value on the right, so we're going to use f of 10, which is 34. And then the last one to look at here, from 10 to 14, that's a jump of 4, and we're using the value on the right, which is 30. So now we just have to multiply and add very carefully. So 28 times 3, I think of this as uh, 3 times 30 is 90, so if I subtract... 6, we're going to be at 84 here, but if you have to, there's no shame in doing long multiplication on the side. So 3 times 8 is 24, carry the 2, and this is going to give us 84. So we have 84 plus, now a nice little trick to multiply by 5, what I do in my head is I multiply by 10, and then I cut it in half. So I do, for something like this, I do 34 times 10, but then I divide by 2. And if I could take, I could take half of 340 is 170. So I know 170 is the next thing we're adding. And then this one, I would just do 4 times 3 is 12 and throw a 0 at the end. So now we add this up. There's going to be a 4 here. 8 plus 2 is 10, plus 7 is 17. Carry the 1. So we're going to get 374, which is choice D. All right, this technique is really painful. So the strategy for this is that we're going to say this is equal to some number 
over the first factor. And then we have plus the integral, and we have some other number b over the second factor, x plus 1. And that's going to give us the 2x. So if we were doing the algebra, these questions are like 90 to 95% algebra. You have 2x over x plus 2 times x plus 1 equals, and if I have a over x plus 2 plus b over x plus 1, what I need to do in order to combine these, I would need common denominators. So this needs an x plus 1. And the next one needs an x plus 2 on top and bottom. So we'd have this. Now the parentheses don't matter because I wrote the fraction separate, but whatever. I'll just throw this in here. So now in the next line, what that gives me is 2x. I have all matching denominators, so we could destroy them all. Equals a times x plus 1 plus b times x plus 2. So now from here on, I like to just plug in x values. That'll make the factors go away. So if I plug in x equals negative 1, that gives me negative 2 on the left equals a times 0 plus b times negative 1 plus 2 is 1. So this just gives me this. And that's going to give us b equals negative 2. So that's one of the constants. And then the next constant I would plug in would be negative 2. And that's going to give us negative 4 equals, and I have a times negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1 plus b times 0. So this one's out now. And I get negative a equals negative 4, which means a is equal to 4. So then what I do with this information is I plug into this part here. So now I have the integral a is equal to 4. So I could just write this as 4 times dx over x plus 2. And then b was equal to negative 2. So I'm going to write minus 2 dx over x plus 1. And now I just have to do the antiderivative here. This is going to be 4 natural log absolute value x plus 2 minus 2 natural log absolute value x plus 1. And then I have a plus c. Notice that both of these terms here, the derivative of x plus 2 and x plus 1 are each 1. So I don't have to divide by anything extra. Sometimes that's a little bit of a little trap they sprinkle in at the end. So now we just have to be careful and match our answer choice. But this looks like it's going to be choice D for question 26. So once again, we're using FTC2 with chain rules. So what we do for questions like this is we're going to replace t with x to the third. So we have natural log of x to the third squared plus 1. But then we just have to multiply all of that by the derivative of x to the third which is 3x squared. Now I could plug in 0 and then multiply by the derivative of 0, but that's just going to give me a minus 0 at the end. So we're just using FTC2 with chain rule here. And now I just have to simplify this. This is going to be 3x squared times natural log of, and then x to the third squared is x to the six, and then plus 1. So this is going to match up with choice E. Question 28, the best way to go through with this one is to just do this by brute force. So we could rewrite the function as 1 plus x to the negative second power. So if I want to find the coefficient of x squared in the Taylor series centered about 0, what I'm thinking of is this term here, f double prime of 0, x to the second over 2 factorial. So I want to find the second derivative at 0, and then we'll be in business. So we have f prime of x is negative 2 times 1 plus x to the negative third. And I don't have to worry about chain rule here, because the derivative of the inside is 1. And now I take the second derivative. We do power rule again. Negative 3 comes down to multiply by negative 2 to give you positive 6 times 1 plus x to the negative 4. So f double prime of 0, if we plug in, is going to give you 6 times 1 to the negative 4th, which is just 6. So now I'm just going to plug in f double prime of 0, which is 6. That's going to give us 6x squared over 2 factorial is 2 times 1. And this would tell us the coefficient of x squared would be 3. So remember, we don't have to find the whole Taylor polynomial or Taylor series. We're just looking at the x to the second term. And we get choice D. All right, so if you made it to the end, thanks for sticking around and good luck on your AP test.